continue in Obadiah. I think I'll finish it up next Wednesday. Obadiah is a just a one chapter little book there, and it's about judgment against uh, against Edom. And the Bible tells us that Esau is Edom. So if you can kind of keep that in mind, and Esau was whose brother? Jacob's brother. So when we talk about the Edomites, when we talk about Esau, we're talking about a direct relative. A, um, now your Edomites are not going to be, they're not entirely Shemite. They're partially Shemite. Because Esau disobeyed mom and dad, went down to Egypt and got him a bride. In fact, every, I think he had three brides, if I'm not mistaken, and every one of them were of Canaanite extraction. And that displeased uh, his parents. So you have the Edomites that dwell, where they dwelled at was just south of the Dead Sea, a place they called Mount Seir. And I, I was going to look, look this up. I got it in my notes somewhere. Uh, who was it that they overcame? Does anybody remember who they overcame to take it from them? Um, I probably won't find it here, so. Probably not going to find it. I, I wanted to look that up so I remembered who they took it from. It's one of the Vites. It's, I think it's the High Vites. Okay. Yeah, find that for me here. Um, but I think it might have been the Hivites or the Harvites. I don't know. Anyway, they took it from somebody and they dwelt there. And what we found out was that when God had two things against them. One, when the children of Israel were in the wilderness and they were making their way to the promised land, they had to go by Edom. And even though they promised Edom that they wouldn't, take anything from their land. They pay them for the water that they drank or the food that they ate as they went through the land and Edom refused to let them through. That was number one. Number two was a lot more, uh, a lot more serious is that when Nebuchadnezzar came in and took Jerusalem and took them captives and wiped out a lot of them, um, the Edomites piled in on top of that and helped out in the deportations, and they helped out in even the killing of these Jews. And we're going to find out that, you know, the Lord's an eyewitness to this thing. Um, oddly, Jeremiah writes about Jerusalem, or writes about the Edomites being judged, but he doesn't write in his account how the, they participated in this thing. So well, let's pick it up at verse 10, because the Lord kind of spells it all out here of, of what he has against them. Against, the, against Edom. In verse 10 he says, For thy violence against thy brother Jacob, shame shall cover thee, and thou shalt be cut off forever. Now, that's pretty serious, man. He says, I'm, I'm, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to wipe you out, and that's going to be forever. Um, the Lord says that, man. You're in trouble. You're in trouble. So, verse 10 through verse 16 is what we're going to cover tonight, and it gives an eyewitness account from the Lord's point of view. Um, he knew what they did. That's one thing you need to keep in, keep in mind. God knows what's going on. He knows what everybody does. The Bible says he beholds the evil and the good. Uh, so nobody really gets away with anything, even though they may try to hide it. Uh, now here's the strange thing. It's, and this is something you have to, you kind of have to look at it in a different perspective. It was the will of God that Nebuchadnezzar take Jerusalem. But yet, he condemned those Edomites when they jumped in on it. Number one, they weren't invited to the party. Okay? And look in uh, Jeremiah chapter 25. Jeremiah chapter 25. And we're going to look at a couple different verses in Jeremiah, but we're going to be moving forward from, verse, from chapter 25. So, Jeremiah 25, 9. Jeremiah 25, 9. 
Three times he says this, at least three times, probably more. He says, Behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, saith the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and bring them against this land, against the inhabitants thereof, against all these nations round about, and will utterly destroy them, and make them an astonishment, and a hissing, and a perpetual, and perpetual desolations. In any of the countries that leagued with Israel, well, Nebuchadnezzar just took them too. And he says that the king of Babylon, that's Nebuchadnezzar, he's my servant. He was doing the will of God by attacking Jerusalem. Now, y'all know that sometimes this turns right back on the people that put their hand against that Jew. That's one thing, that's one thing that uh, it seems like the rest of the world hasn't learned very much or ver very well. I'll bless them that bless thee and I'll curse them that curse thee. Even if God is using you as the hammer, I mean, he'll turn around and, and hammer you back. Exactly right. Jeremiah 27, 6 says, And now have I given all these lands into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant. And the beasts of the field have I given him also to serve him. I mean, he pretty much just said, you know, well, the kingdom's going to be wrested from your hand, and I'm going to give it to him. Why? Because they wouldn't obey. They worshipped idols. They didn't obey his commandments. They didn't follow the... the uh, the five books of Moses that they had, the, the, the Mosaic Covenant. And as a result, God said, I'm, I'm done with you. And man, he gave them a long time to get things straightened out. He sent them prophets, and all they did was persecute the prophets. He sent them the scriptures. I mean, the Lord even gave them signs and wonders, and they just would not turn. They just kept resorting back. Funny how we like to be like the world. So did Israel. Jeremiah 43.10 says, And say unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will send and take Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and will set his throne upon these stones that I have hid, and he shall spread his royal pavilion over them. So, he gave Israel, or he gave Judah, to the king of Babylon. He said he was my servant. But God did not choose nor condone Edom in their part in it. Even though all they were doing is exactly what Nebuchadnezzar was doing. They were just helping out old Neb, their buddy. God said, I'll kill you for it. I, I, listen, if God may have led Nebuchadnezzar to do it, but he didn't lead Edom to do it. Why? They were, re they were related to one another. That was brother rising up against brother. Now, God did judge Babylon... And they were defeated by the Medes and the Persians. But you all do know that Nebuchadnezzar, is one, of, one a type of the Antichrist in the Bible, was saved. You didn't know that, right? Isn't that interesting? I'll give you another one that was saved. It was the worst king that the northern tribes ever had, and that was Ahab. Look in Daniel chapter 4. Nebuchadnezzar is one of the greatest types of the Antichrist in the Bible. And yet he did get saved. Um, chapter 4, verse 33. Well, saved is an Old Testament Gentile can get saved. I mean, he wasn't born again. You understand that? Not happening in the Old Testament. But he says there, verse 33, the same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar. And he was driven from men, did eat grass as oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till his hairs were grown like eagle's feathers, and his nails like bird's claws. Uh, he had a psychotic break. <laughs> you see, what happened? God took his mind. And all because he was boasting about his great kingdom and power, and uh, my hand hath given, my hand hath done all this. The Lord said, oh. Next thing you know, man, he's down there eating with the goats. I'm, you know. Even with the sheep. I mean, you imagine, he, he looked a sight, man. We're talking hair, it's always grown halfway down his back and claws on him, you know. And he, I mean, just, he looks like he's an animal. It says, and at the end of the days, now we're talking, I think seven times, seven years, picture the tribulation, seven years passes over him. You imagine being in that state, in the cuckoo's nest for seven years? At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and mine understanding returned unto me. And I blessed the Most High, and praised and honored him that liveth forever, 
whose dominion is an everlasting dominion. His kingdom is from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. Well, he sure did find that out, didn't he? And he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say to him, What doest thou? At the same time, my reason returned unto me for the glory of my kingdom. Mine honor and brightness returned unto me, and my counselors and my lords sought unto me, and I was established in my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added unto me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, all whose works are truth and his ways judgment, and those that walk in pride he is able to abase. <laughs> yeah. He sure did find out, didn't he? But, you know, you're reading the conversion of Nebuchadnezzar, a type of the Antichrist, one of the greatest en enemies that Israel ever had. Yep. 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 We amounted to nothing more than you know, you know, an animal has three basic instincts. It has self-preservation. You cornered, it'll fight. You can take the sweetest dog that ever was, put him in a corner, start slapping him around. He'll turn around and try to bite you. Self-preservation. Self-propagation. Propagate the species. And then self-gratification. Everybody likes a pat on the head. I told that to the prisoners last night in jail. I said, there's nothing that separates you from a dog or a beast. I said, without the spiritual side of life, you're just an animal. In fact, that's what God calls unsaved men. He calls them beast. So, man, Nebuchadnezzar, he got the, he got the business, didn't he? <laughs> so, In, in Babylon's case, yep, they did get overthrown. In fact, it happened in the night when Belshazzar started partying and uh, the Medes and the Persians came in and took the kingdom in one night. But you'll notice that's after Nebuchadnezzar's gone. So, at least the Lord, I guess this, this more of this, disproves this Calvinistic type of, of attitude. Nebuchadnezzar still had choice. Even he chose to put his hand against the people of God. He still had choice all the way through and made a good choice. Man, Ahab, I mean, he is a, a king of Israel, but he was a wicked king. And the Lord humbles him, and he does about the same thing, you know, repents. and You, you know what the Bible says over there in Ezekiel 16? If you turn, the, bad, the, bad, the evil things that you've done will not be mentioned. But likewise, if you turn and go back to evil, the good things that you've done won't be mentioned. That's how that thing worked back there. So a man could repent and change the direction of his life, like Nebuchadnezzar, like Ahab. God save him. But the point here is that what Edom did was uncalled for. God didn't put it in the heart of whoever the king of Edom was at that time, put it in his heart to go and do this against, uh, against his brother Israel. He did it all himself. So Edom willingly, freely, free will piled on, and it meant their eternal destruction. All right, look at verse 11. In the day that thou stoodest on the other side, in the day that the, uh, that the strangers carried away captive his forces, and foreigners entered into his gates, and cast lots upon Jerusalem, even thou wast as one of them. So what happens is, is after the siege has ended, and the deportations begin, Edom's there. And they're helping. And it says there, notice it says, the day that the strangers car uh, carried away captive his forces... In other words, they, they, they do, I think there's like three deportations, and they're trying to take, they're trying to, uh, first they go for all the nobility. The nobility is the first, you get rid of the ruling class. Here's how you, here's how you overtake a nation. You go in, you win the war, and the first thing you do is you take out everyone that's a politician. Usually you kill them. That's usually the, but you take everyone that, um, the thinkers, and you get them out of there. 
And then you go in and get all the craftsmen, all the people that know, know things, how to build things and construct things and um, engineer things, and you pull them out and you leave just the basest few in the land just to keep the thing from growing up with weeds. And that's exactly what they did. Uh, you'll find when you read the book of Daniel, Daniel and his three friends, they, 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 were, the, they were the thinkers, man. They were the, the intelligentsia. And they took them. They took them all. Um, the Edomites were there and kind of helped out. It says, the foreigners entered into his gates and cast lots upon Jerusalem. Well, now it's, it's time to find out who gets their cut, you know, and who gets what part of what part of the city, I guess. And they, and they, and they were one of them. They, they threw in their lot with, with Babylon, and the Lord took exception to it, an eternal exception. <laughs> Um, now Jeremiah doesn't record their actual participation I mentioned that but the Lord's an eyewitness to this thing um, the fact that he didn't record it you know, I don't know how well, I'm, I'm sure Israel was aware but sometimes you know sometimes you're not aware of all the factors of something I've, I've experienced it in the ministry where something goes wrong and it almost goes over my head because I don't know, I don't know what they're talking about. I don't know what's going on. And, but I know something, something doesn't smell right. You know, something stinks in Denmark or stinks on ice. You know, something, and I come to find out there's a third party. Then it all starts to make sense. And Sometimes you don't know who your enemies are. You think you know, and then you come to find out that there's somebody else in the mix. Um, it's, it's very uh, heartbreaking to find that kind of thing out, but it happens. Um, Lord takes vengeance on Edom. He doesn't forgive them. Uh, he doesn't ask Jacob to forgive them. And in some things, he's not asking you to forgive them. Now, I'll show you a few verses here. 2 Thessalonians 1.8. Uh, he says, In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. God takes vengeance. Well, he knows who's accepted and who's rejected Christ. And at his coming, of course, he's got a whole planet full of, full of them. He's gotten out most of them that believed. And he takes vengeance on them. Look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 30. Now, I'm not going to teach something contrary to, you know... I believe in forgiveness. I'm just saying that <laughs> you'll find out here. Hebrews 10, 30 says, For we know him that has said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense. He didn't say, I will forgive. He said, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. So the Lord knows how to take vengeance. i got one more verse here. I'll read it to you. It's Jude 1, 7. It says, Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication, going after strange flesh, flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. God has a long memory. Some of this vengeance that's going to come on Edom is going to come at the second advent, at least on the land that they, they lived on. God's got a long memory. He doesn't forget. And he's promised vengeance on some. Um, I think when it comes to your brothers and sisters in Christ, you're always told to forgive because Christ forgave you. But not everything that happens in this world, no. Nah. You might. You'll be a better man than I am. But I can think of some things that pass through my mind that could be done to me or my family. Now, I'm told not to take vengeance, though. But I'm not told to forget about it either. 
He says, look at, look at Romans chapter 12, verse 19. Now this is in Romans. This is New Testament. This is written to a, a child of God in this dispensation, in this age. Romans 12. Romans 12, look at verse 19. And what he tells you is he says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves. Okay. We're supposed to forgive and forget. No. Let's read on. But rather give place unto wrath. In other words, you're going to... It's, like it's like your wrath, you're just like... Put it in a cubby hole. Or you do this, you go... You take that wrath and you say, Here, Lord, take it. <laughs> take it. You say, what, why? It says, For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Now, the only way I see out of this for a lost man that puts his hand against a child of God is if he gets saved. Then all's forgiven. And then we're even commanded to forgive him. But if he doesn't get saved, God hasn't forgotten anything. And vengeance is mine. I will repay. And he tells you not to avenge yourselves, but to give place. In other words, just give God that thing and let him do a better job for you than what you could ever dream of doing when it comes to vengeance. Huh? Yeah, there's a good example. Alexander the coppersmith did me much good, good reference. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works or deeds. Works according to his works. There's a good example. I mean, I don't know what you know. Doctor Wright would say he was pitching pennies in the in the collection plate. <laughs> coppersmith. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what the guy did to Paul, but he said he did me much evil. And listen, you're going you're gonna to have folks. Now, yeah, we don't even know if Alexander the coppersmith is, is a Christian or an unsaved man. He probably might be an unsaved man. But he sure does, he does, sure does give Paul fits. And so much that, you know, for Paul to say that at the end, you know what? Paul gave place to wrath. He said, okay, Lord, you get him. And if, if old Alexander didn't get saved, the Lord, the Lord got him. And the Lord has got him. <laughs> he said, yep. The coppersmith. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking we got a hint there, but I'm thinking, what, what could it be, you know? Unless it had to do with idols. You had silversmiths in there that were making idols to Diana. And I thought, well, maybe they got one made out of copper. You know, for the cheap folks. <laughs> to the cheap seats. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. I mean, even poor people can worship idols, I guess. Um, so give place to wrath. Uh, there may be some things that happen. God forbid. You know, I hope it doesn't. But somebody can put their hand against you. And you're going, to have to, you're going to have to let God have it. You pray for their soul, pray for them to be saved. That's a great thing. Uh, that in itself is mercy, mercy and long-suffering. But ultimately, if they reject Christ, the Lord's going to get them back. It's His promise. I mean, it's not like something like, you know, well, maybe He will, maybe He won't. No, He will. He said, vengeance is mine. said, well, I will, I will repay. Man, you talk about, you know, if you can get that over to the one that did you wrong, so you just don't know what's on top of you now. You put your hand against me and I belong to God. And it's true. You know, he said, you know, he said, if you touch Israel, he said, Israel's the apple of mine eye. You realize Israel as a son of God, it's a national thing. He's, they're a national son. They're not individually sons of God. You and I are sons individually. We are the children of God. Sons and daughters, and they, they put their hand against you or me. Father up above is looking down, says, "Not going to forget that." So you can kind of keep that keep that in mind, and maybe that'll help dissuade your wrath. You know, in doing something you shouldn't do. 
Now, I'm not saying you become a pacifist. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying that, you know, once the deed is done, the law stepped in and it's, it's following its course, well, you may just have to Lord, let the Lord handle it. But there's, I mean, there's things people do, man. I'll tell you what. Mm, you want to handle it yourself. But. Okay. Uh, look at verse 12. He says, But thou shouldest not have looked on the day of thy brother in the day that he became a stranger. Neither shouldest thou have rejoiced over the children of Judah, Judah in the day of their destruction. Neither shouldest thou have spoken proudly in the day of distress. Now, he just hates everything about them. <laughs> everything they did. There's three things he mentions there. First, they should not have looked on the day of, on the day of thy brother uh, in the day that he became a stranger. Uh, they became instant Strangers in the land. They were expelled from the land. Um, so Edom was there when the siege ended and entered Jerusalem when the Babylonian army entered the, entered the city. They were there. Why? Because it says they, they rejoiced over them. See that? They rejoiced over the children of Judah, Judah, Judah I get it here in, a minute, in the day of their destruction. Look at Lamentations chapter 5. Lamentations chapter 5, verse 10 to 12, tells you what they were rejoicing over. You know what it was? Dead corpses, ravished women, and starving children. Because that's what they saw when they went in. Lamentations chapter 5, verse 10 to 12, it says, Our skin was black like an oven because of the terrible famine. Uh, if you have a famine that's bad enough, you start turning, you start turning black. Uh, they ravished the women in Zion and the maids in the cities of Judah. Princes are hanged up by their hand. The faces of the elders were not honored. I mean, that's, that, they, they witnessed this, and it says they, they were rejoicing over it. They were having a good time, slapping each other on the backs. Ain't this great? Neither shouldest thou have spoken proudly in the day of distress. That's kind of cruel, isn't it? They were boasting about this victory, boasting about how they had had the upper hand against Israel. Lord hears all that stuff, man. Nothing gets by him. He hears it all. You know, that's the kind of cruel thing that happened during the Holocaust. Some of this same stuff. Um, it was not... It was not uncommon that when an area... When they, were given the, uh, when they were given some command from the German hierarchy that they were supposed to turn in all the Jews, this doesn't matter if it was Poland or, I don't know, it doesn't matter, France or wherever, you'd have been amazed that your own neighbor, the one right next to you, turned you in. Happened a lot. Sometimes they were rewarded for turning them in. Uh, but it gets even worse than that. In... Um, Look at verse 13. It says, Thou shouldest not have entered into the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Notice that in, that, in the day shows up nine times in the chapter. Yea, thou shouldest not have looked on their affliction in the day of their calamity, nor have laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. So they weren't just there just, you know, <laughs> clapping and, and egging on the Babylonian soldiers. They went in there and started taken of the spoils too. You would not believe how many Jews after they, that survived the camps that went home only to find their neighbor living in their house. It's stolen it from. They're still, they are still from, 19, we're talking 19, what, 38 to 1945, they are still, there's still a reckoning going on of those personal possessions and lands and monies that were stolen. They're still deliberating some of that stuff. But I can't imagine, man, I, you know, I come home and not only my neighbor turned me in, but now they're living in my house. Well, these Edomites, and the Edomites are related to the Israelites. And here they are, they're right there, taking of their substance. The Lord says, I see that. God doesn't forget. Look at verse 14. 
Neither shouldest thou have stood in the crossway to cut off those of his that did escape. Neither shouldest thou have delivered up those of his that did remain in the day of distress. Here's what they did. It wasn't just they were there as, you know, kind of like um, um, somebody in the stands. By, not just a bystander, but cheering them. Huh? Spectator. I'll get it here. I can't hear enough. Spectator. They weren't just a spectator. They partook, they partook of their, their things, but they did something else. The Jews that escaped, there was one escape route. And they blocked it. Now I know this map's kind of small. And I don't know if you can tell us. You see right there Damascus? Here. I got this just for that. I get to use it. We're high tech here. <laughs> you see Damascus right there? You see, there's a purple line. I don't know if you can tell it's purple. It goes down, down to, to Hazor and then the door and then Jaffa and Ashdod and Gaza. Down, and notice it goes all the way to Egypt. Well, this is, starts up here in Syria. It's a trade route. They call it the Via Mar, the way of the sea. And it was the only way. Of course, you know, them Babylonians are coming from the east. And they're coming... And they're, you know, they besieged, but they were able to, if they could get out and get to the coastline, all they had to do is just keep going down the coastline and then go into Egypt. They had to go through a little wilderness right there. That's the Sinai wilderness, but they, if, if they could get escape down through there, that Edomite made sure they didn't. And it says they were, in two things in the passage, it says they were cut off. It says, neither shouldest thou have stood in the crossway to cut off those of his that did escape, Neither shouldest thou have delivered up those of his that did remain in the day of distress. So the ones that escaped, they killed them. They killed them before they could make it to Egypt. And the rest of them, they just delivered them up. God remembered that. They call that the Via Mar. I think, I don't know if it's Mari or uh, Mare, or, but the, the Via Mar, it's M-A-R-I-S, but I know the S is silent. I think it's called the Via Mar. So that's what that's about. It's about a trade route, and that's how they were going to escape. And the Edomites made sure they didn't. What a bunch. Uh, verse 15. It says, For the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen. As thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. Thy reward shall return upon thine own head. Now, in the day is found nine times in Obadiah, and it's re referring to a day of calamity that befell Judah. That particular day that they were, you know, the siege was complete, but they had taken Jerusalem. But God has his day, and it's mentioned here, the day of the Lord. It's also mentioned in verse 8, where it says, in that day. So the Lord, you know, the world always has their day, you know, when something happens, but God's going to have his day. And in his day, there's going to be a recompense. There's going to, uh, there's going to be a, uh, a judgment day. And that's the day of the Lord. Um, if you want to read the particular judgments against Edom, Jeremiah writes about it. It's funny, he writes about it, but he doesn't tell you what they did. You find that in other passages in the Bible. But Jeremiah 49, verse 7 to 22 and we, did, we read some of that last week. We talk, uh, it records those judgments. So I'm going to read you Amos chapter 1, verse 11 and 12. Um, Thus saith the Lord, For three transgressions of Edom and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because he did pursue his brother with the sword, and did cast off all pity, and his anger did tear perpetually, and he kept his wrath forever. But I will send fire upon Teman. Remember, Teman's one of the sons of Esau. So he, when he, it's a geographical location also. I will send fire upon Teman, which will devour the palaces of Bozrah. I mean, he's made up his mind. He said, I'm going to judge him for it. Um, notice that he says, whatever they did, I'm going to do. Um, 
Turn to Joel chapter 3. We, we talked about this when we went verse by verse through Joel. You know, have I, have I told you lately what a bright future you have? I mean, rapture. Well, we've got to get to the judgment seat of Christ. Maybe there'll be a little. But then there's blue skies and, <laughs> I mean, a thousand years of peace on the earth where you and I are just going to enjoy ourselves, but not everybody's going to be all that happy. Not everybody. You say, why? Because that vengeance, that something that happened in 606 B.C., some of that's going to be payday. Uh, in Joel chapter 3, verse 6 to 8, the children also of Judah and the children of Jerusalem ha uh, have ye sold unto the Grecians that ye might remove them far from their border. So, they sold, them, they sold them to the Greeks. Uh, they made, uh, I mean, it's just like Joseph being sold into Egypt. They're, they were selling the children, and I mean, anybody who had any worth, they were, they were sold into slavery, is what they're, or whatever. It says, Behold, I will raise them up out of the place whither you have sold them, and return your recompense upon your own head. And I will sell your sons and your daughters into the hand of the children of Judah, and they shall sell them to the Sabians. That's your... Uh, your Sabians are, um, um, I'll get it in a second. Right next door, a lot of desert, a lot of oil. Ra uh, the Saudi Arabians. That's the area of your Sabians. Uh, you know, I mean, come on, man. Arabs love to have slaves. It says, to a people far off, for the Lord hath spoken it. You tell me when that happened. You tell me when Judah is selling somebody else's children as slaves to a foreign people. You show me in history where it never happened. Never happened yet. Oh, okay. That's another point. At the time of Joel or Obadiah, both. Okay. Good point. Prophecy. It's, so when's it going to happen when the Lord comes back? Now, you can say what you want. You say, man, you know, well, you need to read some books. You need to read about, you need to read Auschwitz, The Theory and Practice of Hell. I read that thing. I mean, it was frightening. Uh, you need to read about the, the concentration camps and the, and, and the, um, the pogroms in, in Russia. And you've never been so horrified in your life what people can do to you. Do to your wife and do to your kids. You just can't even imagine it. It's just absolutely terrifying to think that there's somebody after you trying to kill your children, trying to kill you, trying to rape your wife. And what a thing you do about it. Hey, a pogrom is a legalized persecution. In other words, the government gave them and said, yep, go out there and get them. These things happen. I mean, and we're not talking about, I mean, on a large scale. And what happened to that Jew? Through two, even though part of that's part of God's will too. Man, remember talking about that jealousy and that wrath. But the one that put their hand to him, he said, oh yeah, I'm going to punish you. I'm going to kill you and put you in hell. I mean, that's how that thing works. You don't want to be God's hammer. Not until we come back to, at the second coming. Then everything's okay. But you don't want to be the, you don't want to be the one that punishes uh, uh, God's people or God's, or God's Jews. I mean, those Jews are over there in unbelief. They're, a, they're messed up, man. They really are. Religiously, spiritually, you know, I mean, there's, we look at them in a completely different light than the rest of the world looks at them. But I'd never put my hand against them. Don't by getting away with murder. I mean, I, I'd, I'd overlook a lot. We overlook a lot from all these other stupid nations. We should have, we should have carpet bombed them is what we should have done. But Israel, you better just overlook it. That's okay. <laughs> Bless me, Lord. <laughs> I mean, that's what you're wanting. But there's a lot that Israel's done for this country too. Listen, you have what you have because of that Jew. You even have salvation because of that Jew. Don't forget that. Okay.
Um, verse 16, we're going to stop there. It says, For as ye have drunk upon my holy mountain, so shall all the heathen drink continually. Yea, they shall drink, and they shall swallow down, and they shall be as though they had not been. I mean, he's not talking about, you know, the wine of gladness here. <laughs> he said, what is it? It's that cup of fury. Psalm 75, 8. For the hand of the Lord, for in the hand of the Lord there is a cup, and the wine is red, and it is full of mixture, and he poureth out the same, but the dregs thereof, all the wicked of the earth shall wring them out and drink them. Remember I told you he's saving the dregs in the in the bottom of the cup for the nations. Um, so he's talking about here, he says, uh, Yeah, you've celebrated on my holy mountain. In fact, you know it was Belshazzar that was drinking out of the, the holy vessels of the temple. He was drinking wine, you know, and celebrating and having a good old time. When that handwriting on the wall, Mene, Mene, Tekel, you farson, <laughs> thou art weighed in the balances and found wanting. Well, Lord says, you drunk, you drunk on my holy mountain? He says, oh, I'm going to give you something to drink. And it's something that's going to be continual. In other words, the wrath never ceases. That's what hell is. It's where the wrath never ceases. Uh, in Revelation 14.10, here's what he says, And the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture. Here's no, there's no mercy in it. Into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Now, let me turn over there because... I noticed something when I read that. There are two cups. And let me get over here. Revelation 14. So he mentions, he mentions, uh, he mentions the Lord's cup there, or the wine of the wrath of God. Look at verse 8. And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon has fallen, has fallen the great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. See, what is it? Tit for tat. You know what that, you know what that whore did? She brought wrath upon the nations. She brought wrath upon the Christians. She's responsible for all the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And the Lord says, yep, they had to drink your cup, and you're going to drink mine. And it's going to last forever. Okay, ain't this sweet? I just want to preach this on Sunday morning to the kids in Sunday school. But you know, you can't get past it. If you want to understand who God is, you've got to understand that's who He is. But you haven't... Here's what I know. I ain't ever suffered like any of them ever suffered. And I hope I never do. But if I ever did and went through what some of them went through and put their families, what their families went through, I think I'd be carrying around a grudge. I think I'd be calling out for vengeance. You look how wicked people can be. I mean, we live in America. You know, somebody gives us a problem, you call the cops. And if that don't work, you just fill them full of lead. You got the ability, hey, you have the ability to defend yourself in this country right now. You realize that in most every country where you find genocides going on, the first thing they do is disarm them. That's why you never, ever let your government disarm you. Ever. They're just setting you up for a genocide. Because every time somebody gets genocided, if that's a word, somebody disarmed them first. Why they disarmed them? So they can kill them. You know, why, you know why they want to get the guns out of your hands? Not because they're so concerned about gun violence, or they would do something about Chicago. They'd shut Chicago down. They got the toughest gun laws in the, in, in the country. And there's 600 dead a year. That's probably more than that now. Thousands. It's worse than a war zone. And they got tough gun laws. It's not about that at all. It's about, it's about somebody in government that's fearful of you. Fearful of you having a gun. Why? Because your forefathers told you, you need to have a gun just in case your government goes tyrannical on you. That's what Jefferson said. The reason the Second Amendment exists 
is so that we can fight a tyrannical government. Not that we can go hunting or plinking. That wasn't the point of the Second Amendment. The Second Amendment was to overthrow a government that has gone tyrannical and that has subjugated or did away with your constitutional rights. That's why it exists. And that's why they want it gone. They're afraid of it. As long as people are armed, there's not too much you can do. Listen, you get an armed, you get an armed nation. I think, I like what the, is it the Swiss that arm everybody? Man, I'm all for that. I'm for, I'm for classes and teaching. And, and I mean, they, they, they show these uh, generation of rifles that these uh, Swiss men get. Maybe the ladies get them now, too. I don't know. But they show, you know, this old wooden one, you know, <laughs> you know, cap and ball. I mean, I, I, that's a little exaggeration, but almost like cap and ball, you know, where they got the old, the old flintlock type style. All the way up to these black, sleek, fully automatic you know, machine guns. It's like, wow. And they get one. Guy had got it in his closet, you know. He's got to know how to use it, too. You know what that stopped them uh, the, from Germany? They could never invade Switzerland. You can't invade a people where everybody's armed. You can't invade somebody where they're shooting at you from every window. You can't. So you know what the first thing Germany did when he came to power is he passed gun laws. You disarm the people. Why? That way you make them do whatever you want. But the Switzerland, they disarm everybody. I'm for that, man. I believe I believe we ought to have a, a I believe I have a, a, a gun on your side anywhere you go. Who's going to rob a bank when everybody's armed? Come on now, tell me. Who's going to uh, Who's going to jack somebody's purse and run off with it when everybody's armed? Who? You say, yeah, but there'll be accidents. There's always accidents. What's that got to do with anything? But if you train them. You know, there's always going to be there's always going to be somebody stupid that can't have a gun, and you're going to have to you know put a tag around them or something, you know, and do not arm, and that's. <laughs> I mean, that's why we take we don't allow ex cons to have guns because you know they can't be trusted with it. But listen, man, if everybody's armed, you talk about protection. It'd be like the old west. Yeah, who got killed in the old west? So it'd be like it'd be like uh, the the the. Uh, Valentine Massacre. Yeah, who got killed during that? Yeah! I don't see a downside to this. All I know is, man, when, they, when you're disarmed people, you're at the mercy of the world. And if you think them politicians in Washington can't turn on you, you are kidding yourself. They're practically there. Yeah. They hate us. I mean, there's a lot of them up there. They hate us. Everything we stand for. I mean, we're worse than a Trump. And if they ever get the power, you think it, when, they, when they do come for your gun, do you think, I guarantee you, man, it ain't going to, they're not going to, they're not going to blink. They're going to come for you. Okay. I'm just a pastor that believes in the Second Amendment. Peace on earth, goodwill to men. But if that don't work, lock and load. <laughs> All I know is there's a, uh, and I, I wish I could tell you the YouTube uh, video that it is, but it goes from one group to another and talks about all these different genocides down through the ages and that especially during the time when we had guns and black powder and all that, and how they were disarmed. And after they were disarmed, they were, they were easy kill. And it happened nearly every time you turn around where somebody's disarmed. So, you know, when, they're disar when you disarm people, then they can't, they can't, well, that's not, the, I don't believe in, the Bible doesn't give us a right to rebel, though. You realize that? I mean, Thomas Jefferson was granting a privilege, and the Second Amendment is granting a privilege, I don't know if we've got exactly. I don't know. I think the Lord's going to get us out of here before it gets to that. I'm all for that, amen? I don't care what happens after I'm gone. The <laughs> whole place is going to bust apart. But, um, but while you're here, you, you're, you, you, know, uh, you know how I know that... Uh, because Second Amendment doesn't matter whether it's in the Constitution. It's a, it's a God-given right to a Christian. Did you know that? 
because they go sell your garment and buy your sword. And at that time, a sword was the, it was, it was a, a self-defense weapon. It was actually an offensive weapon. But it was the weapon of the day. And if a Christian asked me, I said, well, first of all, you know, if you don't know how to shoot a gun, learn how to shoot one. Every Christian should know, you know, and if you don't want to handle one, that's fine, but you at least know how to shoot one. You might find a need for it one day. And then um, have a gun. Be as responsible, be as careful and responsible as you can. Now, if you get to that point where you can't handle one uh, properly, get rid of it. Because what will happen is they'll, they'll find the gun and use it on you. So there's some, some things that go along with that. Anyway, I don't know why I'm getting into all that. Obadiah just... Okay. Uh, prayer request. Pray for... Names are escaping me tonight.